not a con. Uh, my name is Jim. For any of you who don't know me, um, I guess there's a couple of people that might. Um, and this is just photography hour two. Any of you sat through uh, Amish's hour one? Uh, hopefully this is redundant. Um, and uh, hopefully everybody gets to learn something. So, our presentation here was uh, uh, created under the influence of uh, gin, and um, a lot of the test photography was as well, so once again, I can't apologize. Um, and I might be drunk right now. Um, this is most of the stuff we're gonna talk about, so if you, so if anybody here understands all of this already, um, you should leave because it's gonna get boring. Um, but we're going to talk about uh, some sensors, including or some uh, sensors in, in the bus, including film, everybody's favorite, uh, raw files, a little bit of EXIF, um, and some exposure stuff, including unfucking up your pictures, a um, little bit of GIMP versus Photoshop. I am partial, um, and some post-processing demos, including uh, white balance correction, some crazy stuff like uh, fake cross-processing and uh, distortion correction, some other stuff. And if we have some time. Uh, some extra credit stuff. So I guess we can begin. Um, wow. Uh, so okay, I actually drew all this stuff myself, even though I did steal all the uh, the ideas for the images from everybody's favorite uh, dpreview.com, which I highly recommend. So most people have sort of some understanding of how 35 millimeter film works. Uh, basically, you know, light hits the film and it passes through various emulsion layers, an, an RGB layer, obviously, or, or uh, an R layer, a, a green layer, and a red layer. Um, that didn't make any sense, sorry. And, um, and uh, the, uh, the light affects the chemicals and produces, uh, well, produces an image. And of course, that just gets sent over to the, uh, the roll of 35 millimeter film. Um, in, the, uh, in the digital paradigm, there's kind of two different types of sensors that exist now. There's, there's the standard color filter array, which probably most people have in their cameras. Um, this includes CCDs and CMOS sensors. There is an exotic type of sensor known as a Fovian sensor that really only is found in some Sigma cameras, and I've never seen one, so as far as I know, they don't actually exist. Um, but basically, the way it works is, um, you know, light will hit the sensor, and in the case of a color filter array, uh, it'll hit either a green pixel, a blue pixel, or a red pixel. And um, but the problem with this is that, uh, as most of you know, an RGB image will not have individual red, green, or blue pixels. They have just a color pixel, and so the image processor needs to sort of interpolate the uh, the color of an individual pixel based on four photo sites of a regular uh, of like a CCD or a CMOS sensor. This is what makes a Fovian sensor uh, somewhat uh, better than a standard color filter array sensor because a Fovian sensor will actually produce an actual color pixel and won't have to interpolate anything. And so it has the potential to produce um, cleaner and sharper images. But like I said, it is exotic and it it, the technology is still being developed, but it's something that we all uh, look forward to. Um, now, there are some advantages to the way film works. Um, perhaps most notably, the flexibility that, that it affords in terms of changing the type of film you have in your camera. Now, if you put like a roll of, of 200 ISO speed film in your camera, you have to burn that up you know, effectively before you can change the roll of film. I mean, obviously you can just pull it out, but you got the film in your camera. But at the same time, you could put IR film in the camera. You could put like something crazy like ISO 3200 in your camera or ISO 50. You can always change the type of film you have in your camera. But when you buy a digital camera, you just have a sensor and you don't really have a lot of latitude in terms of how the sensor gathers light, what it does with the light and how it reacts to the light. Um, but that's sort of the magic of post-processing, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, let's see, so, okay. Um, this is kind of a, a very abstracted uh, version of, of how, how data works in your camera. And I, I did make all this in uh, PowerPoint, so it's kind of silly looking, and I, I beg your pardon. Um, so, uh, 
you start with an image, you take a picture of a scene, and the light travels through optical elements and hits the sensor. Um, all cameras work the same in this regard. Uh, whether you're talking about a pinhole camera, a film camera, a digital camera, basically anything. It's all light traveling through optical elements um, and hitting some kind of sensor, whether it's film, whether it's a digital sensor, it doesn't really matter. Um, where am I here? Um, with a digital camera, um, the light's going to hit the sensor, and as we saw previously, uh, depending on the kind of sensor you have, it's going to hit a particular type of photo site. Um, after it hits the photo site, it travels to an analog to digital converter, which I'll talk about a little bit more in a little bit. Um, but the analog to digital converter uh, basically produces a bunch of bits that end up as data, which eventually ends up, after it passes through the image processors, as an image. And as is probably uh, demonstrated here, with uh, with my image, uh, the the first one is not really anything like the second one, and of course the reason for that is because no matter what you do, um, the image that you end up with is never going to be the same as the image that you started with. There's a number of reasons for this, including uh, dynamic range and color space, which I will talk about in a little bit. But uh, suffice it to say, it's always an abstraction, and unfortunately, there's no real way to get away from that. But there are things you can do to try to. Um, try to get closer to reality, if that's, you know, what you want to do with your photography. Um, all right. So, um, I'm not an electrical engineer, so this is correct. <laughs> if anybody is, uh, please let me know. Uh, but basically, uh, what happens with a digital to analog converter is data is going to get passed from the sensor, data as light that ends up as, uh, as, a, as an electrical current. And this is a very simple uh, kind of demonstration of just like a four-bit digital to analog converter. Um, most digital to analog converters that you'll find in your cameras are going to be like 8 bits, 10, 12, something like that. Um, so the signal is going to come in from the sensor and it's going to come in as a wave, or not necessarily as a wave, but at least as, as a series of, of electrical current. It hits the digital to analog converter and the digital to analog converter assigns a value based on the strength of the, uh, the current that it's receiving. Um, so in this case, you'd end up with like a like a four-bit file, just in this in this simple example. Um, but uh, like I said, a lot of digital analog converters will be you know between uh, ten and twelve bits, uh, sometimes just as few as as eight. Um, but the digital to analog converter is what is responsible for dynamic range, and dynamic range is is kind of a buzzword of digital photography that not a lot of people completely understand. It has to do with the variation between the darkest pixels in an image and the lightest pixels in an image. And you'll see this in pictures where, like for instance, if you're, if you're standing inside of a building, inside of a house, and you're taking a picture and the window, like in the background, is just pure white, that's a limitation of dynamic range. Because what's happening is the values of, the, the amount of light coming in from the window is too bright compared to the rest of the scene and the window's getting blown out. Like, there's just, there's just too much there. And it's not like a contrast problem. It's, it's a problem with the sensor being able to balance between the darkest parts of the scene and the lightest parts of the scene. Some of this can be compensated for with things like, uh, like metering properly, but when it comes down to it, this, between the sensor and the, and the analog to digital converter, um, they're just not able to keep up with the amount of variation in the scene that's coming through. In fact, the human eye uh, even has the same sort of limitations, where if, you look at the, if you're looking straight at the sun, you're not going to be able to see anything but just pure white. And it's, it's sort of the same thing. In fact, it is exactly the same thing. It's a dynamic range problem. Um, and uh, although I should say that um, um, it's been said that that the human eye is capable of something on the order of 25 to 30 stops of dynamic range, and as a point of comparison, um, like uh, like a high-end film, like uh, like uh, like uh, what is it? Sorry, like Velvia film, for instance, might be good for up to 10 to 12 stops of dynamic range, um, and uh, like probably the best digital camera that you could buy today which would probably be like a Canon 1D Mark II, is rated at something like nine stops of dynamic range. 
So you can see that we have a long way to go before we can match the, uh, the power of the human eye, but, um, or even some high-end films for that matter. Um, but you can see uh, like kind of how fundamental it is to photographing a complete scene when there's a lot of variation between light and dark. So, but um, another part of that has to do with the color space that's involved. And I wonder, all right, here we go. Um, Oh, that's crazy. Um, color space is how the data that your camera produces is interpreted as color. Because the, the data that your camera produces is really just a series of bits. It's, it's not color information. It's not an image. It's just a bunch of bits. And your, and your machine in, uh, and whatever you're using to display it, whether it's a, you know, a computer displaying to a monitor or a computer outputting to a printer, it needs to be able to describe objectively what that information means in terms of color. Um, and so color space is sort of just a way of, um, of describing mathematically within a range um, what a particular bit value means. Um, so in this case, we can show an example here of just sort of like a like a kind of a light orange and and what that means in terms of um, in terms of RGB. Uh, this is of course just an 8-bit value, and it is arbitrary. But in any case, um, lab color, which might also be called CIE lab, uh, is is sort of a theoretical color model that is said to describe the range of human vision. And as you can see, all of our artificial color spaces are are invariably a lot smaller than that. For instance, CMYK, which is, which is what uh, pretty much everybody uses to print anything. Like any magazine you ever pick up is going to be printed in CMYK. Um, and as you can see, it's a lot smaller than what, uh, than what the human eye is capable of seeing. Um, ARGB or Adobe RGB is, is a color space that a lot of uh, high-end uh, digital cameras are able to uh, create files in. Um, which is bigger than CMYK or sRGB, but at the same time, it's still a lot smaller than what the human eye is capable of seeing. Um, sRGB is kind of significant because um, it's what most cameras are going to default to, uh, and it's also what most normal computer monitors are going to be capable of, uh, of displaying at. Um, there are some crazy expensive ARGB, ARGB monitors, but uh, most human beings don't have them, so it's, it's kind of irrelevant. Um, but what's interesting about that is that you might be able to take pictures in ARGB um, or even some other sort of uh, strange exotic color spaces that exist, um, but you're not really going to be able to see them on your monitor, uh, which is to say that if you go to edit them um, on your machine, you're not going to be seeing all the colors that are actually in there. Now, of course, there are ways to downsample. There are ways to sort of approximate uh, between two different color spaces. But if you're looking at an ARGB file on an sRGB monitor, you're A, not seeing everything, which means that when you make changes, you're going to be making changes to parts of the image and colors of the images that you're not actually seeing. So it can be kind of tricky in that regard. Um, that being said, um, if your camera is capable of taking pictures in ARGB, I do recommend it. Um, you end up with a file that has, that, that ends up capturing more colors than if you just took it in sRGB. Um, and it's usually better to downsample later than just limit the, limit the number and the amount of colors that you're taking in the first place. Um, but we're going to talk about this a little, a little bit more uh, in a minute, too. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about raw files, um, <laughs> and, uh, and I like sushi as well. Um, raw files, if your camera is capable of producing them, and most cameras these days are, um, but a raw file is, um, is basically a direct dump of the data that your sensor uh, gathers straight to a file with no interpretation, with no, uh, with no correction, no compression, nothing. It's just all the data that your sensor gathers all at once in one big, huge file. Um, this is usually a good idea to do if you're, if you're interested in, in post-processing later, but it has a, an additional advantage in that most raw files will be higher than 8 bits, because if, you're, if you have a sensor and a digital to analog, con or I should say analog to digital converter, um, that is that operates in, in more than eight bits, for instance, like a like a 10-bit or a 12-bit uh, 
analog to digital converter, you're going to end up with a, with a 10 or 12 bit RAW file, which is going to have more dynamic range, more color, more flexibility than like say an 8 bit JPEG file that's already compressed, that's already been processed by the, by the camera and by the uh, imaging circuitry. Um, but we're going to talk about this again a little bit more later. I'll, I'll show you a little bit about uh, what, what RAW files can do. Um, EXIF is your friend. As a digital photographer, um, EXIF is, is uh, it, it tells you everything about the exposure, everything about the image that you could ever possibly want to know. And actually, let me show you a little bit about what I mean. Uh, if, if you guys haven't, hi Clippy. Um, if you guys don't have a lot of experience with uh, EXIF data, it is pretty amazing. This is output from, this is output, and you guys can't read this at all, I'm sorry. Um, well, I, I guess it, it's, it's illustrated nonetheless. Um, this is output from a command line program known as JHead, which if you guys aren't um, uh, uncomfortable with the command line, I highly recommend. Um, it's just a simple little command line program that if you run uh, any file with EXIF data in it, it'll tell you everything you need to know. And um, there's all kinds of good stuff in here, like uh, exposure time, um, like metering, flash, uh, what kind of color or what kind of color space the image was shot in. Um, you get basically anything you want to know about the image, including um, like what aperture is shot at, what time it was shot at. Um, in theory, there's actually provisions in EXIF data for um, GPS coordinates. Which is fun, but uh, you know I don't have a camera that has a GPS in it. I wish I did, but I, I don't. I'm still waiting for that technology to come about. Um, but it's good stuff. So actually, let me show you too um, what JHead is capable of. And uh, I wish I could change the uh, resolution on this. Hmm. All right. And uh, I mean, you guys saw the output of this, but oops, what am I doing? Ignore that. Um, yikes. So as you can see, you get all kinds of nice information. The reason that you're going to want this information, uh, particularly for editing purposes, is a lot of programs um, can use this information to archive images to tell you a lot about uh, the exposure, you know, the, it tells you a lot about the exposure that the image was taken in. Um, you know, it, you, you can't read this from, from back there, and I apologize, but uh, nonetheless, it, it gives you a, a good idea of the, the wealth of information that you can get from EXIF data. We're going to talk about why that's important too later and uh, in different places that it's going to come up. Um, so let's see, where were we? Not necessarily, not necessarily part of the JPEG. Uh, it's something that the camera includes. Not every JPEG will have EXIF data, but pretty much every every image produced by a digital camera will. Um, yes, yes. You you could embed EXIF data in any JPEG. In fact, not even JPEGs. Just effectively any file. I mean, there's there's specific headers um, that that uh, is allowed within the JPEG specification for EXIF data. Um, and so, I mean, yeah, you, you could add it. You could, in fact, JHead will let you do that. JHead will let you um, uh, change EXIF data, pull it from one file to another. And that's one thing that um, can be uh, like a, a marker of a modified image. If it doesn't have uh, EXIF data, uh, it's probably been modified because a lot of programs will strip out the EXIF uh, when it's been modified. Photoshop won't, but a lot of programs will. Um, or if the EXIF data doesn't correspond to what you're seeing, it may have been modified. But that's not necessarily important because uh, you can modify EXIF data. You can pull it from one file to another and do whatever you want with it because you know it's, it's your file. Um, so, all right. Um, so, we can talk a little bit about exposure. This might get a little redundant uh, if any of you guys were sitting through Amish's speech, I don't know, yesterday. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll be brief about this, but um, 
uh, just to uh, to let everyone know, uh, or for anybody who's not really familiar with these concepts, um, there's there's three things that go into a properly exposed image. Um, between ISO, aperture, and shutter speed, they all balance to create a ex uh, properly exposed image. Uh, now there's trade-offs to this. Uh, specifically with ISO, the trade-off is always noise. Uh, as you increase ISO, you also increase noise. Uh, shutter speed is pretty obvious to most people. As you, as you decrease shutter speed, motion blur will start to set in. Um, and as you increase shutter speed, you can obviously take pictures of faster moving things. Um, aperture is something that is um, is not usually intuitively obvious to a lot of people. Aperture has to, affects depth of field. Um, aperture is is the basically the size of the opening in the lens. Um, and as you as you increase as you I should say as you increase the size of the opening of the aperture, depth of field decreases. Um, if you guys want, I can talk about this a little bit later, um, but just just to set a, a basis for this. Um, so help, I fucked up my picture. You got like a crazy exposure. Uh, what are you gonna do? And of course, uh, like the the heartbreak of blown highlights. Like, as I was talking before, like for instance, if you take a picture of something that has too much variation in a scene, uh, for instance, if you're taking a picture of somebody, uh, and that's not, not actually a flamethrower. Uh, even though it does kind of look like it. Uh, but if you're taking a picture of something that contains both very light and very dark images, um, like for instance, something like this, um, with you know, depending on the uh, dynamic range of the camera that you're taking it with, um, you're probably going to end up with, well, you're going to end up with more or less amount of this. This is just a really bad example of blown highlights and limited dynamic range. Uh, this was taken with a really crappy Olympus camera, like, I, I don't even know, probably like like a quarter of a megapixel. Um, and so you end up with something like this. Um, also something like this, which is the same thing, where it's just, um, you're going to end up with, with blown highlights in, in the light areas, but you end up with the same thing also in the dark areas, which we call blown shadows, which uh, is a situation where the, you know, anything that's dark below a certain point is just pure black. Um, and this really isn't a, a question of something falling off the color space. It's a question of, um, of just the, the sensor and the, the sensor being unable to um, to like properly appreciate the difference between the, the extremes of the image. Um, and so we get into post-processing, everybody's favorite. Um, and I guess the, oops, sorry. Um, there is a, a, an ongoing debate always between the GIMP and Photoshop. Um, the GIMP is like, okay, uh, if you can't afford Photoshop, if you can't afford Photoshop or get Photoshop, um, Please do, because like, I don't know. The GIMP is like, the GIMP is good for free, but it's not good for image editing software. So, all right. So let's get into that a little bit. Um, let's see what we can do with some screwed up images. If anybody has any questions, like by all means interrupt, because uh, I'm just making this up as I go anyway. No CS, no, no, no. <laughs> Not that I have anything against it, it just doesn't happen to be on this. But you can do the same thing in um, in most of these images. You guys didn't see that. <laughs> ah, so let's see what we got. Something fun. Let's do one of these. Sorry, I should be a lot more prepared. All right, this is a good one. So, let's say you took uh, what would otherwise be a really cool picture, like this, um, but you really goofed it up. Um, the exposure, obviously, is you know, 
not. Um, but f you say hypothetically, you really like this picture and you wanted to save it. Um, maybe it was the only one that you got that was, uh, that was in focus. Maybe it was the only one that you got that, uh, that everything was crisp, uh, that w didn't have motion blur or something like that. Um, and so uh, simple uh, contrast balancing is something that Photoshop can handle pretty well. And now I'm sure most people have a lot of experience with this because it's, it's pretty easily done. Um, but nonetheless, uh, this is something that you could do in film and that uh, processing labs could do fairly well, but uh, usually not with the amount of flexibility and fine tuning that you can do uh, on a machine, on a computer. And of course you can do this uh, naked in your, uh, in your room uh, whenever you want at three in the morning. Uh, so it's it's good fun. Um, so just you know, simple uh, simple exposure correction is pretty easy to do. But what you're going to invariably end up with in a situation like this is uh, increased noise. Um, now noise is kind of the um, it's kind of a, a demon of the of the digital realm. Uh, noise did exist in the film days, except it was called grain. And the same thing, of course, exists with digital, except we just call it uh, digital or, or I'm sorry, noise or uh, or digital grain. Um, and as you can see. Um, as contrast increases in, in an image like this, noise also increases uh, precipitously to the point uh, where if you really wanted to increase the exposure of something like this after the fact, uh, you would end up with what might end up being a completely unusable image uh, given the amount of noise that uh, occurs. If this image had been exposed properly, there wouldn't be this much noise. Um, but that's, uh, that's kind of one of the... Uh, something that you can always watch for when you're post-processing. There's, there's always a line between uh, how far you could push an image and how far uh, you, know, you can push an image and still have it look halfway decent. Um, so let's talk about white balance a little bit. I know I've got some images here somewhere. There we go. So. Um, White balance has to do with uh, how white is being uh, described in an image. Now, to us, this image looks very blue. Um, and as we all know, iPods are white, so this is wrong. Like, we know that's wrong. But your machine doesn't know it's wrong. Your camera doesn't know it's wrong. Um, so how do, you, how do you fix this? Photoshop has a lot of tools to let you uh, fix white balance. My personal uh, favorite happens to be curves. Um, which can be kind of uh, kind of daunting to people at first. Um, it has a lot of power and a lot of uh, flexibility to change things. Um, but but you need two hands to use it. Um, one of the things that it can do is automatically set white balance, uh, or I should say, a, a white point, a gray point, and a black point. Um, using these uh, tools here. And the, the GIMP does have something analogous, and I'll, I can show you guys that in a minute if you'd like. Um, but basically, all you really need to do to set a white, a white balance or to change a white balance in an image is find a white point or decide what you want to be white, and then just make it white. If you just click, suddenly everything's white. Um, and what you're really doing is you're just changing the way white is being interpreted in the image. Um, this can have uh, consequences you, you know, if you hit something that's not white, or that, that's not white, it's not going to look right to you, but your computer doesn't care because, you know, Photoshop, neither Photoshop nor your printer nor your monitor nor anything else knows what the image is really supposed to look like. Only you do. Um, so it's just a question of making it look right to you. And at some point, it might. That looks not bad. Um, and you can also uh, set a gray point, and what that's doing is finding uh, where gray should be in an image, and that's, that's wrong. And as you can see, um, depending on where you set it, it'll, it'll change the image back from, from normal to something crazy to back to normal again. But of course, it depends on how you want it to, uh, to come out. And what's happening here really is, and this is just another way of showing, this is, this is the levels palette for anybody not uh, familiar. And levels will do more or less the same thing, but it gives you a little bit better idea of how this is changing. And as you can see, the histogram is kind of bouncing around, and the reason for this is because um, it's, it's pushing, it's not so much pushing the values of the data around, uh, but it's kind of pushing how that data is being interpreted. 
Um, Photoshop gives you the ability to change this information after the fact, and it, it can be sort of a destructive process, though, because you are you 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 can be losing data when you're doing this. For instance, if you were to set white balance to something like this and then save the file, all this would be white. This is completely blown out. It's it's uh, there's there's no more data there. I mean, this you wouldn't be able to pull this back to something recognizable. Um, raw files, however, let you um, let you get away with that and gives you give you a little bit more flexibility. And I can show you guys a little bit about how that works and about why uh, why uh, raw is uh, is particularly helpful in that regard. I wonder how much time I got. So, um, Photoshop does have tools to uh, edit raw files. Um, I just happen to prefer the way uh, Canon uh, has their stuff set up. So um, I'm just going to demonstrate using their software. Um, to my knowledge, uh, I don't believe that the GIMP offers the ability to edit raw files. I might be wrong about that. Um, or there might be um, third-party solutions out there or plugins that let the GIMP do it. I couldn't tell you really. I'm sorry? Fair enough. Oh. Right, there you go. <laughs> um, but one of the things that RAW will let you do, which is very nice, is because you're ending up, because you end up with um, a file that contains all the data that the sensor got without any, um, without any interpretation, it gives you the ability to change all kinds of things after the fact, uh, non-destructively, and with a lot more flexibility. Um, for instance, uh, you can change white balance, um, you know, you, you can change white balance uh, initially from uh, when you're shooting the image originally and, and tell your camera like I'm shooting under these conditions, I'm shooting under sunlight, I'm shooting under tungsten lights um, and your camera will just uh, balance the image based on what it assumes white is going to be underneath those lighting conditions. Uh, but what a RAW file will let you do is just change it to whatever you want later. Like for instance this was shot in my hotel room like a few minutes ago um, and so if we set this as daylight or shade, we get something that's pretty close to normal. And it's done so non-destructively. All the data is still there. It's just that the, the way white is being interpreted has been changed. Um, now, of course, you can do this. You can use this to change it to something, um, something crazy um, using like a, like a Kelvin temperature. And, uh, and, you know, obviously do whatever you want to manually or, or change it to something very strange. Um, or, or uh, for that matter, just kind of push stuff around and do whatever you want um, using the controls that it offers. Um, but that's one of the reasons why RAW has a lot more flexibility than, than a, a pre-interpreted JPEG file. In addition to the fact that it's 12 bits and you get that much more dynamic range, you also have uh, the, uh, that much, uh, the, uh, the ability to edit white balance and things like that non-destructively, which can be very helpful later. Uh, the problem with RAW files is that they need to be um, no, nobody can read them. I mean, except for something that's specifically designed to read the raw file, because it's just raw data. It's not been interpreted. It's it's not anything that you know a web browser or a printer or anything like that is going to be able to understand. And so, when you're dealing with raw files, you're always going to have to end up converting it back to a JPEG. Um, and so, if we do that, I can show you um, what ends up happening, which is that it takes a little while for your computer to. Uh, to process the image, to convert it back into something usable like a JPEG, um, but usually it's uh, it's usually worthwhile. And as soon as this changes, we can move on to something else. Um, so it's pretty handy in that regard. Um, hmm. Um, yes and no, because a TIFF is still going to be 8 bits, and a TIFF is still going to be interpreted by the camera. It's going to be better than a JPEG because you're not going to get compression artifacts, but it's not, it's not like, it's not as good as a RAW file, frankly. And, you know, a lot of cameras, um, or at least a lot of cameras, well, I should say a lot of cameras today uh, have the ability to output RAW files. If your camera's a few years older, it might not. Um, if you're really concerned about the, uh, about the quality of the images that you're ending up with, um, 
as low a compression as your camera's capable of doing is better. Um, but if you can do raw and you're really concerned about flexibility after the fact, um, go with raw if you can. Um, yeah, I mean, basically that. Um, every manufacturer has their own type and their own specification. It, and it, it often changes from model to model. Um, so, which is why, uh, like, Photoshop's raw plugin changes every now and again. It updates quite frequently to take advantage of new file types and things like that. I believe Adobe. Uh, recently tried to put out a specification to standardize raw files, which is a really good idea, but it's too new to have caught on yet. Um, that's something that I'm looking forward to in the future. Um, but no, there's, there's really no standard. There's really, it's just kind of whatever you get. It's just a, a file full of data, and there's not much else. So, um, we're going to talk a little bit about perspective correction and distortion correction. Um, which is always fun, because most lenses will distort images. Um, so, let's see. For instance, um, something like this. Um, this was taken with uh, with a fisheye lens, but this is not this is not uh, like a really egregious example of uh, perspective distortion. Um, on your handout, if you guys if you guys got one, you do have uh, uh, examples of types of distortion, and there's really there's really only two different types: there's pincushion distortion and barrel distortion. Um, pincushion distortion is usually the result of telephoto lenses, um, usually at the long end of a telephoto lens. Which um, even on like a compact digital camera, if you, when you're zooming into something, you're you're probably going to see um, some uh, some amount of pincushion distortion. Um, if you're if you're backed out a lot, or if you're if you have like a wide-angle lens, you're usually going to see at least some amount of barrel distortion. Um, it really upsets some people. Um, some people really don't like the way it looks. Um, you can use it to artistic effect. Um, I think it looks cool in some circumstances, but if you want to get rid of it, there are some really handy tools out there that let you do it. Namely, um, everybody's favorite PT lens. Uh, PT lens is derived from that's not going to work, is derived from um, a uh, software library that was put out for um, panorama tools, which was developed to um, uh, be able to produce uh, panoramas and like uh, sort of quick time VR like um, things from uh, images and things like that. And so it's, it's pretty handy and it has some very powerful um, perspective correction algorithms in it. And um, as you can see, when I pulled up this image, it already told me what type of camera this was shot with, it told me what model it was shot with and what lens it was shot with. And the reason it knows is because it's able to read the EXIF data, which is one of the places it comes in. Um, Windows XP actually, just to get back on EXIF, Windows XP actually has the ability to uh, display some limited uh, amount or some, I should say, some of the headers from EXIF. So sometimes you can sort images based on what camera it was shot by and things like that. Uh, I think we're all looking forward to the day when operating systems are able to uh, uh, read more metadata because everything should have more metadata in it. In any event, um, what this ends up doing is it it figures out uh, based on EXIF what uh, what it can expect in terms of the distortion of the image. Like this plugin, and there are some standalone versions of this. And actually, there's a uh, there's a command line version of this that runs under Linux if you like manipulating your images without seeing them. Um, I'm not one of those people, though. Um, it, it doesn't know necessarily based on based on the lines here. It doesn't know what is curved and what is straight. Um, so it's just it's kind of doing this blindly, where it's just assuming based on the EXIF uh, what kind of perspective it should be expecting, and then and then what it does is it wraps the image around a, a fourth degree polynomial, and you end up with, if everything works out, um, and after a few seconds a corrected image and what ends up being uh, hopefully more rectilinear, more straight and perfectly straight. Um, and so, as you can see, the, uh, the difference can be pretty dramatic. And like I said, some people do like uh, distortion for uh, art artistic purposes. If you don't like it, there are some handy ways to get rid of it. And actually, on your, uh, on your thing, there's, uh, there's some software listed on there that can handle perspective correction. Um, 
So let's see. Actually, so that, that was just the plugin that runs under Photoshop. Uh, there is a standalone version that runs under Windows. Uh, I can show you guys that because it's, it's more or less the same thing. Um, but it gives you a little bit more ability to uh, play with the images and play with the way they're getting wrapped around. You can see that again. Let's see. Let's do this. And uh, this is the hotel. You guys didn't recognize it. And um, so what we can do here is you guys can see um, kind of how the image is getting pushed around. And there's sort of a balance between uh, between the way or the, between the, the the way that the image is getting wrapped around. And if you know you can always do it manually if, for instance, uh, the software doesn't have a preset for the type of camera or the type of lens you have. Or, for instance, if you end up with an image that doesn't have EXIF or something like that. So you can always do it manually and play around with it. But it does give you an idea of how uh, the image is getting pushed around. And it's kind of kind of interesting in that regard, if you're into that kind of thing. Um, the standalone version is called RadCore. Um, where'd it go? Um, and, you know, I'm sure, uh, I'm sure you can find it through Google or anything like that. Um, the, uh, the plugin version, there's a GIMP plugin. Uh, it's called PT Lens. Uh, it's pretty handy. I do recommend it if you're interested in any kind of perspective correction. Um, and let's see. I am kind of running out of time. Does anybody have any questions about anything? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Radcore and any, anything derived from PT Lens is free. It's all open source software. Um, so that is free. Um, the, the plugin that I was running is just a Photoshop implementation, um, but there are free versions out there, yes. You can. It's interpolating pixels either way, um, because it's it's making up data in certain places, particularly around the edges. Distortion will always be more obvious around the edges, um, and if there's no pixels there, it needs to make them up from somewhere. And so it's always going to interpolate from neighboring pixels. There's there's no way to get around that aside from shooting very high resolution and hoping for the best. Serial number. Um, I think CS might. Um, I, I don't know. Any, uh, CS or uh, Photoshop CS is just Photoshop eight. Um, CS two actually just came out, which would be Photoshop nine, I guess. Um, and it's got some really interesting perspective correction tools built into it. Um, they see, Adobe really seems to be moving toward uh, moving their software towards. Um, digital photo manipulation as opposed to film fi uh, uh, film manipulation, or I should say like digitized film manipulation. Um, so they're, they're making some strides in that direction. Um, I couldn't tell you about anti-piracy measures, though, uh, at your own risk. Echo. Yes. Um, my understanding, and this might be wrong, is that um, I, I think some consortium of, of banks or governments or something like that, they, they wrote a library uh, that's able to um, like detect certain types of currency, namely like US currency and euros and things like that, and um, got software and hardware manufacturers to, uh, to implement that in their, in their, uh, their products. So actually, if you try to scan a dollar bill on like a modern scanner, it won't scan. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't know. I think it just stops. I don't know. What are you, what are you scanning a dollar bill for? Uh, 
Um, it probably just has some some generalized version of it that it's you know checking against. I imagine. I, I don't know how it works. All I know is that it's said to work. I've never tried it. I, I'm sure you could figure out a way to like get a digitized version of currency. Um, I, I leave that as an exercise to you. It is. I would guess that if that's the case, I would guess that there must be some, some very generalized version of what, a, like a bill or a currency looks like. I mean, I guess if you have, you know if you think about it, they all do look the same. They're all rectangular and they all got like a little picture on them. And if you probably if you like drew something that looked close enough to a dollar bill, you probably couldn't scan that either. I would think. I don't know. Yeah, but that might not work either. I don't know. It's a good question. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Does anybody have any other questions? Yeah, 10 minutes. Um, I do know that PT Lens won't run under OS X, and that pisses me off. Um, there, there's a, a handy program, I think it's just called dfish, um, that runs under OS X, and it's pretty handy. I think it uses a different library, but it, is, it, it produces pretty good results. Um, I'm a big fan of uh, DSLRs. Uh, they're more expandable than just uh, like compact digital cameras. Um, if you have a compact digital camera, um, depending on what kind you have, I, I know that you can get like attachments and stuff for lenses that will produce like telephoto effects and wide angle effects like that. I don't have a lot of experience with them. I do know that they're out there, um, but you know, compacts are compacts, and they, they don't usually have a lot of uh, they don't usually have a lot of accessories, at least not compared to the DSLR realm. And they're overpriced. Right. True, yeah. Shoot manual, I guess, if you want more control, if you want more latitude. Um, I'm a big fan of Canon imaging products. Um, that's just my bias. Um, I know that they're uh, CyberShot, I think. Is it? PowerShot, sorry. Um, I, I, my understanding is that they produce very nice images and they've got good manual control. I don't know, maybe somebody can back me up. Um, what can I say? Um, like the ability to set things like aperture, shutter speed, ISO manually, as opposed to letting the camera decide on its own. Um, you know, like, I, like uh, for instance, I should go back to this probably. Um, like I was saying, I mean, there's, you know, there's three different things that will determine whether or not your image is exposed properly. Um, between ISO aperture and shutter speed, um, pretty much any, I mean, pretty much any modern film camera and and any digital camera will be able to balance between these things and, and, uh, and strike a, a proper balance based on what it assumes the scene is like. Now, it's always gonna, it's always gonna mess up when you're taking a picture of something that has a very bright light in the scene. Like, if you're trying to take a picture of something with the sun in the scene, it's obvious, it's always gonna, like, get screwed up um, because the sun is just too bright. But, um, 
you know, anything that has, uh, or being able to use manual control or any camera that has manual control will let you set those variables manually and, and you can produce some, some crazy results if you know what you're doing. New pixels instead of copy pixels. But as far as uh, cell phone cameras go, I mean, I don't know, didn't somebody, somebody just came out with like a five megapixel digital camera? Like, I, I don't understand the point of that, you know, the problem with cell phone cameras is that um, the sensors are so small and the optical elements are so small that you're really not going to end up with like a nice clean image. I mean, it's really, it's kind of a limitation of the optics and of the size of the photo sites. Um, the bigger a sensor gets, the less susceptible it is to noise. The smaller a sensor gets, the opposite is true. So as you end up with, with you know, digital cameras that are, have these remarkably small uh, sensors with remarkably small photo sites, you're just going to end up with more noise, and people don't really want noise in their images. Um, if you want uh, covert pictures, though, one of my buddies, he got really good at um, taking his little compact digital camera and just holding it at his, at his hip level, and he got really good for a while just like aiming it properly and getting like just perfect face shots. A little bit of practice, like you'll be there. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> you got to get a smaller camera. All right, they're, they're kicking me out, you guys. Uh, thanks a lot, everyone. You've been great. I hope everybody learned everything. And uh, 